and we continue with this series of videos about Mother Earth. So, was Cuatulique as diabolical and monsters as the Spaniards described? One point we must make clear about the worldview of our ancestors is that only they themselves, without interpreters and without distortions, would be able to tell us all the symbolism and richness that Cuatlicue had. Since that is not possible, we have to rely on third-hand sources and interpretations. From the European perspective, anything that didn't suit then was seen as diabolical and evil. Well, we could justify them to some extent when they saw skulls, skulls that represent death, or snakes, which in their secret scriptures are as symbolisms of evil, but that depends on which symbolism they are referring to. Obviously, in their beliefs, these things were monsters, with a being that has grotesque fangs and hands and hearts hanging. Yes, but let's draw a parallel that shows the errors of those meager ways of seeing the other and their thinking out of ignorance. Isn't it equal monstrous to see a crucified murder? beating human beings bleeding from all sides? In other words, to see a corpse hanging in a plain sight? Of course, the value judgment cannot be so simple in either case. That's why, although, as we mentioned in the second part of this video series, Cuatulque is not satanic. She did command respect, adoration and even fear. After all, she could bring drought of flood, and that still happens today, and with that, she could kill many human beings and animals with natural disasters. However, today we will explore several possible symbolisms of Cuatlicue, based on the information we have. Firstly, her proportions are something worth noting, as she is a large fish, in which we see geometric shapes, the use of triangles and rectangles in its form. In other words, it wasn't just a matter of grabbing on a stone and sculpting it as they pleased, because in its elaborations, it is evident that there was a plan of creation behind it. Now, if we look at it from the front, it shows a kind of mirror effect, just like we see some do today. It appears as if it is divided by a mirror, which reflects its body. At least, on the front, there is a glimpse of similarity in geometry and elements on the left and right sides on its body. It also has a rectangular shape in its design which coincides with the famous golden ratio. And if we overlay the golden ratio on an image of it, we see this result. But even more astonishing is that if we overlay another golden ratio in a mirror effect, we get this result. Obviously, here we merge Quatlique with Yolotlique, seeing both the snakes and hearts on her skin. And of course, when mentioning Yolotlicue, although less well-preserved than her sister. These geometric aspects will be equally present in her. So, there is much more to see, more than just an evil diabolical stone. Now, moving on to the other elements, let's dismythify some other things. It is easy to distinguish two skulls, one in the front and one in the back of her, and removing the European perspective, looking only at the pre-Hispanic dualism, she represents life and death. But now as the Spanish believe that Jesus conquered death by resurrection, here life and death coexisted.
Now, regarding the skulls, we highlight the detail that they have eyes, as they are not just skulls with empty sockets. What does it tell us about the process of life, death, and vice versa? In other words, how the feelings develops, or can be seriously how the body tissue decomposes until only the bones remain, having the middle ground between the process of life and death. Now, in relation to this, let's not forget that in various types of burials, just as babies are in fetal form within the womb and then emerge into the world, when they die, they should also return to be buried in the earth in a fetal manner. We can also relate this to the hands that form a neck lens, belong the supposed sacrifice and dismemberment of body parts. It could be that just as the earth brings living behinds into the world, it also gathers them when they die, embraces them, covers them, and merges with them in the end. Their death is not the end, as the decomposing reminds give life. Thus, an eternal dual cycle of life and death is established. Let's not forget that a symbolism of the schools was that they were a kind of seeds. In fact, the entire body itself, where the dead, whether animal or human, is planted, and from the remains, new life sprouts. Of course, we must also present the other version of their symbolism, where it is mentioned that some of it is related to sacrifices as it appears to be decapitated, and the two snakes we see emerge from the decapitated head, some believe that the snakes are jets of blood, coming from the sacrifice. And well, some refer based on the accounts of the 20 day ceremonies celebrated by Mexicas throughout the year, that precisely in some of these festivals honoring the earth, sacrifices were made to nourish it. and part of these celebrations involve flagings, which we can see in this part of the sculpture, or even decapitations, but setting aside that bloody perspective, perhaps the explanations are simpler and more natural. Explanation that speak of its strange, power and origin, having a violent beginning, as it truly was where for thousands of years there were explosions, separation of continental masses, and millions of violent phenomena, which we continue to experience today. These are natural processes that were perhaps metaphorically referred to in chronicles. For example, in Story du Mexique, the origin of the air is mentioned, dating back to the year one rabbit where the following is written. Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca descended from the sky to the goddess of the air, Tlaltecutli, who was filled with eyes and mouths in all her joints, beating like a wild beast. And before they arrived down, there was already water, which they don't know who created, on which this goddess walked. Seeing this, the gods said to each other, we must create the earth, and saying this, they both transform into two great serpents, one of which sits the goddess by her right hand and left foot, and the other by the left hand and right foot, stretching her so much that they broke her in half. So, if we combine this narration with the sculpture itself, contrary to those who say that the sculpture depicts the process of decapitation, could it actually be that the two serpents on the neck were Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca? And that what we see in the sculpture is nothing more and nothing less than the process of the creation of the air? And of course, that monstrous being, as mentioned in the narration, as we have already referred to in a sense the air, natural or whatever we want to call the planet, can indeed be a wild beast. Nature can be brutal. It is also worth noting that its creation formed the four cardinal directions, 
as the narration indicates when it's mentioned that its arms and legs were the stretch. So, for those who talk about human sacrifices, we could also be witnessing the natural dismemberment of the air, the earthquakes, the movement of continental plates. So, little by little you can see that while everyone can interpret whatever they want, without false certain, it depends on the perspective from which it is seen. We can also see blood, human sacrifice and dismemberment or a fusion of humans with their environment. It recognizes the power of the air for good and evil. It is also seen as a mother who, like any good mother, is willing to give everything for her children, to give them life and to receive them in death. So what do you choose? An evil being or an object that goes beyond? But there are still more symbolisms to explore, which we will see in the next video of the series.